Here we are from the locker room with Coach Mike Smith, uh, three-time NFL Coach of the Year. And this year we've got another Coach of the Year who we're very lucky to have uh, helping us from the locker room. I think will really give us an opportunity to share some of his wisdom. And you know, that's Coach Steve Forbes, the new head basketball coach at uh, Wake Forest. So thanks for being on, Coach. And um, we're anxious to hear your thoughts and ideas on leadership and coaching and life in general. So, uh, Mike, I know you got a couple uh, questions for Coach Forge. Why don't you get this ball rolling? I will. First, I want to say, Coach, hey, thank you so much for coming, coming on. And I want to tell you, I've admired you as a coach, not only on the court, but off the court with uh, seeing you at football games, uh, interacting with your, with your players. And that kind of leads me into – a couple of questions, but the first one I want to ask you, Steve, is uh, your path to becoming a head coach is probably a little bit different than than a lot of guys. Similar right. to mine in terms that I was in my late 40s when I got my first opportunity, but tell us a little bit about uh, your background and the hurdles that were put up and the things that you had to go through. Well, Mike, you know, I'm a former baseball player, um, so I like to look at it like this. I kind of walked to first and stole second and got sacrificed over to third and stole home and got to where I'm at today. You know, um, a lot of people in this, in this business that, you know, they want to hit a single and they want to land on third base. Um, and you got to work your way around the bases and get experienced to, to really probably pre be prepared for the, for these kind of jobs that, you know, that we're all trying to get. Yeah. You know, I started out in junior college, you know, and um, I didn't play division one, uh, basketball. I was really a better baseball player in college than I was a basketball player, but I loved basketball. I loved the game. I was one of those players that really was uh, probably more of a cerebral player, you know, than a talented player. And um, I just decided in college, that right at the end, Mike, that I wanted to coach. I got a degree in history and a minor in political science, but I really didn't want to be a lawyer, which I kind of studied to be. So I figured there's a lot more talented lawyers to me than out there. So I, I just went on this path and, you know, I typed up, I say the word type. Now I used a typewriter. I typed 200 letters to be a GA my senior year in college and got 199 rejection letters. And you got one, one person that wanted to talk to me and it was Bob Hanson in Nebraska, Omaha. So on my honeymoon, I took my wife on our honeymoon to Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> and I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend that uh, by no means. Uh, I think she thought I said Oahu, but I said <laughs> Omaha, and uh, and I interviewed and stayed with my former college coach and didn't get the job. So I went back to Southern Arkansas where I graduated from, and I was the SID with no benefits for six thousand dollars a year, no computer, and my wife taught second grade at Waldo, Arkansas. We lived in a one room cabin with no heat. And then my, um, my wife became uh, pregnant with my first child, Elizabeth. And so it was time for me to get a job, a real job. I had to get something that paid with benefits. So I became assistant baseball basketball coach at Southwestern Community College in Iowa. And I did that for uh, five years. And I went to Great Bend, Kansas and coached another four years of junior college in Kansas at Barton County. And then I got a break. After nine years, I got an assistant job at the University of Idaho, which I – I took it sight unseen. I just, I, I knew the coach. I'd never been to Idaho. I said, it's my first division one job. I'm going to take it. Um, didn't realize how hard a job that was going to be. Not a lot of players around Moscow, Idaho. If you dropped an atomic bomb on Moscow, Idaho, you would not kill a division one player. I can promise you that. And so there was a lot of planes, trains, and automobiles there and recruiting. You know, and then, you know, I went to Louisiana Tech where uh, my wife's from Louisiana. That's probably where I, uh, my second professional player that I became involved with, Paul Millsap, you're probably familiar with, played for Atlanta Hawks. I re helped recruit him to Louisiana Tech. Um, left there and went to Illinois State with Porter Moser, who ended up coaching in the Final Four, you know, a few years, uh, a few years ago at Loyola. And then I got, I got a lucky break. Uh, Billy Gillespie hired me at Texas A&M. And I say lucky. They were 0 and 18 when we went there, but I learned how to coach. Um, I, I learned how to run a program. Billy's a, a masterful coach. Uh, uh, we turned the program, we had the largest turnaround in the history of college basketball at that time. Won 21 games our first year, and then went to the NCAA tournament the next year and beat Syracuse. And then 
I, as you know how this profession works, I, I was on the move, you know, and Bruce Pearl had tried to hire me. When he got the Tennessee job, I turned it down, and then he offered me the job again, and I took it. So I went to Tennessee for five years and had a great run and then got fired. Like, and I told my wife when we got fired in year 22, we were lucky. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, it took 22 years to get fired. There's a lot of guys, it happens a lot faster. You know, so I went, um, I went back to JUCO, um, back to, to doing what I love to do. I had an NCA show cause, so I really couldn't coach in Division One. I, I, I guess I could have, but I didn't really want to put that on anybody. Um, really, the only thing I could not do was evaluate or contact prospects, but it wasn't worth it. So I went back to JUCO and um, went 62-6, and six, went to a couple of national championships. I knew I had to get with the right person if I was going back to Division One, and I got lucky with Greg Marshall at uh, Wichita State. He was coming off a, a Final Four, and he hired me. And, uh, you know, we went, I don't know, 65-4 and four the two years I was there. I had great players. I was kind of along for the ride. And then, you know, it comes Doc Sander and Dr. Nolan, you know, and I, and I had known a little bit about East Tennessee State because I was at Tennessee. I knew it was – they loved basketball. I didn't really follow the program that close. I knew Coach Bartow uh, personally and well. And so they called and asked me if I'd be interested. And they came out and interviewed me. And quite honestly, I thought I was interviewing, but I wasn't. They were really kind of talking me into taking the job. You know, and so I took the job and had f uh, five great years, and it was really hard for me to leave. But then just, you know, got this opportunity during a pandemic to uh, to coach in the ACC, and it was just a hard, hard thing to turn down, you know. And it, it's about trust, as you know, with ownership. I had great uh, leadership uh, relationships at ETSU, but, you know, the athletic director here is John Curry who was my um, sport administrator at Tennessee. So I knew him well, and he wanted me to be the coach, and so that meant a lot to me. Yeah, Steve, and, and you know, so many people in coaching uh, go through uh, trials and tribulations, to, you know, to get to get to where they, they are. And I think it's a, a great story that you're able to tell and tell and share with our listeners about, it's not like you're gonna just go and become a coach at the collegiate level and you, you have to go through these battles and I, there's a trend right now especially in uh professional sports and even professional football i'll take it because i know that a little better but you know they're hiring these 34 year old guys that you know or don't don't have the experience and uh what do you think about that and and, and that trend in terms of uh these guys that like you and and myself that went through a you know went through a journey to get an opportunity to do it I mean I I, I wouldn't trade it for anything um, I don't I don't begrudge a, a guy if, if somebody's willing to hire somebody because of they're young you know they don't have a lot of experience that's not on that person it's on the person hiring them you know for me uh, I thought I was ready but I wasn't you know now that I think back to it um, you know there was some opportunity there was some times maybe a little bit earlier in my career I didn't really chase jobs, but um, I kind of wanted to be a head coach like everybody. But now that I look back on it, there was no way I was ready. Um, and, I, and I will tell you this, the one thing that probably prepared me the most for being the head coach at East Tennessee State, my first Division One job at the age of 50 was coaching in Northwest Florida, JUCO, those two years. Because I had been with Bruce Pearl, I had been with uh, – uh, Billy Gillespie. I'd been had all this experience, and then I had to go a chance to go back to junior college and apply it. And and I really didn't run my program any different at East Tennessee State than I did at Northwest Florida. I just had more people helping me, you know. And so I wouldn't trade that for anything. I, I think there's something to be said for somebody that has not has been up and down the ladder, has hit the bottom and rose back to the top. Is got their butt beat and knowing how to come back. I've learned more from losing than I have from winning, you know, and, and I think that's hard to understand when you're young. Oh, I, I agree with you, coach. Uh, th there's so many more lessons from a loss than a, than a W. And uh, I think that's one of the things that I, I, we lose sight of sometimes. And, and we have to make sure that we get grounded and understand that the tough times are when we're going to get stronger 
It's not, you know, it's not the good times. Yeah. We get stronger through the tough times. We find out what our real, where we really are in our heart and our mind. You know, it's just, it's just, this is going to be a strange analogy, but one of the most stressful seasons I've ever been through, we won, a, we won an NCAA record 35 wins in a row, which Wichita State my first year went 35-0 and 0 until we lost one game in the NCAA tournament in Kentucky. Why was it stressful? It was because we hadn't, we hadn't lost. So we didn't were – were, were we really getting better or were we just putting a Band-Aid on something because we were winning? Sometimes, as you know, winning sometimes just covers up your issues. They're still there. And so it was, like, very intense those last month of pushing the team, keeping them hungry. So, I mean, film study, if you came and watched film that year, I say this about Coach Marshall because he's an unbelievable coach. If we were 30 and 0. If you were to watch film, you'd have thought we were 15 and 15. You know, I mean, it's just we were on edge the entire time because of what we just said. We we didn't have that loss to go back to and say, see, look, you do this, you do that, and this is what happens. We didn't have it. And then when we did experience that final loss, that first loss, we had no chance to fix it because the season was over because we were in a one-and-done situation in the tournament. And so um, that was a different experience for me personally just from, you know, uh, from – learning from a loss. I think one of the biggest things I'm most proud of at East Tennessee State was the fact I think in the five years we were there, only one time did we lose three in a row. And that was at the end of the season when we were winning the league, my third year. We always were able to bounce back, you know, from a loss. And I think that's important. Oh, I think it is, Steve. And I think in – I'll I'll share with you a story with the Falcons. Uh, When I took the job, one of the things that I said that we were – our goal was was not to have back-to-back losses. And if you can go through a season in the NFL or in college or even in, ba- in basketball, maybe it would be not lose two, uh, you know, two games in a row because your schedule's longer. But I told the guys, if we just go through and don't lose back-to-back games, we're going to look up in December – and you know what? We're going to have learned a whole lot about ourselves and our football team, and we're going to be right in the middle of the playoff race. And lo and behold, that's what happened. Yep. And so, you know, sometimes you've got to yeah, you've got to take those losses to make your team grow. Like you said, you went, you guys went thirty-five and zero. You really didn't have a chance to, you know, to grow. I I could not imagine the pressure that you had on you, not only because of the no going undefeated all the way through the regular season, but you had no way to fall back and have that learning lesson. And I get imagine that first loss was devastating to you, to you and your team because it happened in the tournament. Yeah, I don't even really know how to explain it, you know, because you're sitting there in St. Louis, the season's over. And we're like, how can the season be over? We, we just lost our first game. Yeah. You know, we can't even go back and, and correct it. You know, um, it was a really odd, odd feeling. One of the things that I'm a big believer in is making, treating practice like a game. So I tell my team after every practice, either it's a win or a loss. We lost yesterday. And so I tell, it's exactly what you said. To learn how to string wins together, you have to do it in practice. And so then if you don't have losing streaks in practice, it'll help you, I believe, in the season. And that, you know, I think in the four to five years I was there, I think we only, we never lost two in a row. It was always just one and we bounced back, you know, and, and, and I think, but I take that, I think this is the way we attach, attack practice too, is that, you know, you put that on them after every, hey guys, today was a loss, man. Tomorrow you got to bounce back. Tomorrow you got to do better. Tomorrow, you know, we can't string two losses in a row in practice, you know, and, and I kind of that's kind of how I do it psychologically with the players. Yeah. And Steve, I know that w- when you let the give that information to the players that hey, this wasn't good enough or that was a loss, they they under hey, they understand what hey, what you want out of them and how they have, you know, how they have to perform and how every day really is a game. And uh, that's a great way as a coach and for young coaches, I would, you know, that would be one of my takeaways right now is that, Hey, you've got a grade 
every practice, you know, whether it's a win or a loss or not good enough for us. And you can't base it on who you're playing the next week. You got to base it on, Hey, this is a game. I agree with you 100%. Oh, I, you know, I've been more mad after wins than losses. In fact, that, that is typically my reaction. I think sometimes for the players, it's a little, little shocking. I can only think of one time in the five years at East Tennessee State, I was just livid after a loss. And it was at Furman, and I lost my mind. But normally, I'm pretty reserved after a loss because I need to go home and I need to decompress. And I need to see it before I make a rash decision. And a lot of times, there's a lot of times we win and I'm just disgusted by the way we won. And I don't have any problem saying that to them then because they're feeling good about themselves. You know, um, I think one thing about doing it in practice the way we do it is if when you get your team to really care about each other and care about and knowing that winning and losing is important to them, losing should hurt. So I want them to hurt a little bit after practice when they go down the locker room they're like dang man we didn't do well today you know I have coaches and happy and we, we lost if we were playing today we were playing duke today we got beat you know and, and that's i think you're trying to develop that kind of mentality you know with your players on a day-to-day basis yeah and, and steve i know we and i have doc and doc's not had his chance to get in here but i am so intrigued that at uh the conversation we're having and I want to ask you a couple of questions because I've seen it from afar uh, and it's about the it's about culture and building yeah. building culture uh, I was so in, so impressed about the culture that you had you could see it and I had the opportunity to see it watching games and watching your team and how they interacted with one another in an actual game but I also got to see it in social settings, uh, you know, I got to see you interact with your with your players at tailgate parties before football games, and I think you know, I think that that's part of, that's the part of coaching that young coaches and some coaches don't understand that we have to connect with our players on so many different levels. And I know uh, you told me a story, and I've heard it about you having the guys always check in. I want you to talk to me about, you know, building, you know, building a culture and how you, and how you go about doing well, it. I mean, honestly, you know, you said it in your book, right? Um, what we, what do we stand for? And that is the biggest thing for me is identity. Cause I believe you can establish your identity. Identity is immediate culture takes time. You know that. Yes. And so, but I don't think a lot of teams know who the hell they are. And when I speak to you know, clinics and those type of things about identity. I just did it Sunday to the Wisconsin coaches was if I asked your team, what is, what is your identity? Could they tell me? Cause I don't think a lot of teams can. And so I keep it pretty simple, you know, and it's not, this isn't rocket science, but my, our identity and, and everything we do identity wise matches up to how we practice the drills, wh- whatever we're doing matches our identity. It's play hard, play smart, play together. And we don't always play smart, but we're going to play hard and play together. And I think, Mike, I think a lot of teams think they play hard and they don't. They don't. Uh, We're going to share the ball on offense. We're going to be gritty, grimy, tough together on defense. We're going to possess every ball with two hands. And we're going to do what we're supposed to do when we're supposed to do it on and off the court. So, in a nutshell, if you didn't know anything about basketball and you can't watch my team play, you should be able to walk out in the parking lot and say, man, those guys play so hard. They play together. Man, are they tough on defense. They grab that ball with two hands, and they execute. I believe if you could just do that, no matter what offense or defense you're running, you're going to be successful. But your players have to be bought into that every single day, and you got to hold them accountable to it. How do you do that? we got to have a relationship with your players, a genuine one, not one that's just based on practice. So I, I have the players check in the office every day before 1 o'clock, Monday through Friday, and they have to have a conversation – with one of us coaches, hopefully me and every, and who, and it can't be about basketball. And, and, and I can't tell you how many times I've, I've stemmed off problems or issues just by reading bad body language. You know, a player comes in here at 10 AM and he's got his head down. I can ask him, you know, what's the problem? Well, you know, I'm homesick. My girlfriend broke it, whatever it is. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing well in my class. 
But if I only see him at practice, there's no way that's going to happen. Because practice is a totally different environment, as you know. And I, I, I tell my players all the time, my biggest fear as a coach is one thing, that 10 years from now, we'll have a reunion or I'll be at their wedding and they'll say to me, Coach, if you just would have pushed me a little bit harder, you know, I think I could have been a better player. I'm not going to give my players that. And so when I go to practice, it's game on, which, is, it, which means it's going to be the truth and the truth's going to hurt. And I don't ever, ever take this thing to my practice. I never take my phone to practice. Never. I'm, I'm always focused on – I love practice more than the games, to be honest with you. Because you're going to practice more than you play. We play 30-some games every year. We have 150 practices. So you better love to play and you better love to practice. You better love to coach practice. And so – uh, my players, I'm not, I'm not afraid to put my foot up their ass, but I'm also not afraid to tell them that I love them. And, and, and I, that's genuine. And so that relationship starts by an understanding that coming to the office is not the principal's office. Normally when the head coach calls you to the office, you, for you, you're probably going to cut his ass or, you know, you're going to tell him, man, you're going down, you know, I'm taking you, you're going to the taxi squad or whatever it's usually not positive and I and I think this I think what happens a lot of times in coaching is we spend so much time we don't spend enough time with guys that are doing right we spend so much time with the guys that are doing wrong and and I think allowing those kids to come in the office every day and interact with us you're seeing the kids that are doing the right things too and I've been places where if you didn't see them in practice you never saw them ever they didn't come around so how do you have a relationship with them? And I live right across the street from Wake Forest. They can walk to my house. My house is wide open. Uh, my family has always been that way. And so it's, it's really, you can't say family. We always say family on three, but you got to live it. And, and you have to, you know, you can't just say the words and then not do it. And I, I, I'm just a firm believer in that. Yeah. Yeah, Steve. And I think that that, you know, that builds trust. And when you have, tr hey, when you have trust in your play in your players and the players have trust in you, it only bodes well for, a, you know, a, for a successful program. And I've seen that uh, from afar, what you did at East, at East Tennessee State. One of the things that I would do, Steve, it, in, at the Falcons is that I would make sure that our coaches, we, every day we had to walk through the locker room twice a day. There you and, go ate lunch with our with our players and you couldn't eat with your position you all you know oh, in, I like in, football, in football you have you know the linebackers you know and the linebackers mm -hmm. you're always interacting with them so we'd have the wide receiver coach go sit down and yeah. he might eat with three hey, three defensive linemen right and that's where we got a lot of our interaction mm -hmm. of course we didn't have classes so we would go we would go through the day and our time to really have an opportunity to visit with them was in the cafeteria and then we also had it designed I had the way that the building was designed it was a little different we had to walk through the locker room mm. every day to go to the cafeteria yeah. so we were always in you know it was quote yeah. the player's locker room I told the guys when I got there that's not going to be the player's locker room that's going to be our locker room mm. uh, that's our house and yeah. And we all live in it, and we're going to share it. And we're all going to hey, we're all going to go, and we interact. And you know, there'd be a card game going on, and you may sit down and play a hand or two. I think those are the things as as a coach. Yeah. When you interact with those guys, they they know you better, they trust you, and that doesn't mean when you get on the field, Steve. I've watched you coach, and I the thing I'm you coach them hard, man. And, and when you watch a, a Steve Forbes coach basketball practice. They are getting coached every single minute. And that was the thing that I was most impressed of. There wasn't a second going by no. where you, you weren't coaching the hell out of them. Well, you know, I, I believe in, you know, to play fast, you got to practice fast. And so I also believe in tempo and practice too. Um, you know, you brought up something that just, it's funny, just triggered my mind. The last couple of years at East Tennessee State in the summer, and I always use the summer to kind of, create the chemistry is kind of like not boot camp, but it was basically me against them trying to get them to play through fatigue and all those things. But the always, uh, we always catered our, our, our evening meal into the locker room and we had tables in my last couple of years, we put tables in there and we had name 
cards for the players. And we moved the name cards every, every meal. So they had to sit with different people and they had to put their phone away and have a conversation with the people they were sitting with. I kind of read that Pat Riley used to do that on the plane when he was the head coach of the Lakers, he'd move the name cards around. So the guys had to interact with each other. And I thought that was a great idea. And so I, I did that um, the last couple of years I was there. And I think that really helped, as you said, and then us coaches after practice, we could filter through, you know, the locker room and hang out. And like you said, just laugh, make fun of each other. I'd, I'd hang around practice a lot and the guys would, you know, be shooting half court shots and, you know, we'd, we'd do that and, and have some fun with that. But, I think I do think they have to see a different side of you uh, besides just being the CEO, you know, of the program. Oh, absolutely, Stephen. That, that interaction has got to be both on the court and off the court. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, Doc has some questions to, that we want to talk about. And I'm sorry, Doc, that I've kind of, yeah. when you go coach to coach, we hey, when we go coach to coach, uh, sometimes we get, hey, we get going. I mean, listen, Doc's been in my office every day for five years. I mean, I don't want to talk to him now. <laughs> I mean, I can't, it's amazing I got anything done, you know, during that time I worked there just based on Doc telling me, you know, about the days of, in Cincinnati or VCU or Memphis, wherever, wherever he was being a, the AD at. So, um, you know, I, I got, I pretty much know his story. Yeah, I, that's for sure. I've heard all those stories before, you know, and each time they get kind of, uh, you know, they kind of get elevated a little right. bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know. Um, hey, but let me let me ask you something. You know, clearly, you know, I, I, we know each other really well. But you know, one of the things that I've always wondered about, and we're going to ask every every uh, individual we have on the show um, this question: one person in your life besides your family who had the most impact on you, and what was that, and how did that really affect your your career, your your whole um, thoughts on life. Wow. Well, that's a hard one. You know, but I'm going to go all the way back to probably the mid '70s, and I'm going to tell you, I probably if Lute Olson hadn't become the head basketball coach at Iowa, I probably wouldn't be. I probably wouldn't have loved basketball, and I may not be a coach. I think I think him coming to Iowa had a huge impact on me. Um, I just fell in love with the Iowa Hawkeyes. And this was a time when, as you know, not, there's maybe one game on television a year. But I had the opportunity growing up in a really small town uh, right outside of Iowa City. I could go up there. You know, I could go to the game sometimes. I could go to practice. I was back in those days. You could just sit up in the stands and watch practice. You know, and I, I just – I think being in that environment, and in 1980 they went to the Final Four – and, and coach was just like, um, you know, he, 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 he oozed class. I mean, I, I mean, he's just a very classy person. He ran his program, you know, people didn't question him and the way he did it. Um, it just was a model program. And I think me probably just being a witness to that um, really probably shaped me as a, a – just my passion and my love for the game, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, I've, you know, being able to work for, for uh, you know, Billy Gillespie and Bruce Pearl and Greg Marshall all in a row, we don't always get to choose who we work for, you know, and it's, it's, that's a hard thing. And I always tell young coaches, you got to be careful because, you know, you're putting your career in the hands of the coach you're working for. So you got to be, you know, you got to try to be as selective as you can, even though I know the jobs that are hard to get. But you got to think about who I've worked for. You know, Billy was the Big 12 Coach of the Year when I was there. Um, Bruce was the SEC Coach of the Year when I was there. And Greg was the National Coach of the Year when I was there. So, I mean, I've had some really good teachers as far as not always what to do and what not to do too, right, in coaching. And then you have to, you have to fit all that into your own personality. Um, and I overcoached the team when I first came there. And I told you that, you know, that first semester, I was trying to do all the things we did at Wichita State, run all these plays. And we were about 500, if you remember. And I was really frustrated. And I went back and, you know, it wasn't, wasn't the kids' fault. It was my fault. 
And then we went back second semester. I think we ran six plays and won 19 games. I just let them play, you know. And so, um, I don't know. I, I I guess it'd have to be, you know, I'm probably Coach Olsen. I, I, you know, I had Don Showalter was at that same time, Don Showalter, who's the head of USA Basketball now, actually was the high school coach at my high school, which is crazy. Which is, I mean, I graduated 32 people. And, but he was the high school coach there and he's now head of USA Basketball. And he got me involved in camps and things like that, but probably those guys. Hey, you know, one of the things I think, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Every coach has a brand, you know what I mean? And, you know, clearly your brand is you're a great recruiter. You know, everybody likes you. Um, you've been around a while. But one of the things I think that people don't understand or don't ever get to see is how organized you are and how, how well thought you are out you are can you talk a little bit about that and how important that is um, yeah. is this and just you know your organization and how you kind of try to you know try to I mean I was always very organized as a student you know and I, I wasn't always a great student or early in my life I was terrible you know as an elementary kid but then my you know I'm, I'm a first generation college student in my family um, but I became very organized I was really big on a to-do list so what I have done now, as you know, I have this to-do list I have, and it's organized based on my job. So my AD is at the top, which where you would have been at one point, uh, deputy AD, academics, compliance, donors, SID, uh, basketball alumni. Then my assistant coaches are down the middle individually. Um, and then I have my director of basketball ops, my assistant head coach, strength coach, trainer, development, video. Joe's in charge of player relationships and I have my personal list to do and then my family. And so I attack this thing every day the best I can. And I, you know, and I, uh, you know, check them off and move on. But um, I don't micromanage, as you know, um, I hire good people and I let them do their job. I'm not a big, uh, I, I have meetings, but not very often. Um, I just, I believe in, in letting people do their, do their job. And, and I give them some direction, obviously, but, um, I'm very organized. You're right. And I'm a little OCD when it comes to that. If, if you looked at my desk and I don't have much mess on my desk, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty straight line, you know, in my life, I don't have a lot of distractions, you know, especially right now. I mean, basically I just, I just do my job and go home. You know, a guy asked me the other day, what do you do for, a ho oh, Dan, one of my former guy I used to work with, he asked me, what do you do for a hobby? I said, I don't have a hobby. My, I, I, I work and I go home. I'm a terrible golfer. I'm bad at fish, fishing. I don't have any patience for that. So, you know, right now it's just my job. And But I love my job. And when I quit loving my job, then I'm going to join you and Mike playing golf. I mean, that's just the way it's going to be, you know. And so, um, but I, yeah, I, I think it's important to be organized. And it's something that I've carried over to my own children. I mean, my daughter works there. You know, she's in your doctoral program. She has the same list to do. That she just uses it for uh, academics for football. Let me ask both of you guys, let me ask you a question. Clearly, a lot of your success is because you've been able to lead and manage. And I know from just being around both you guys, what's really important to you are your staff. And how do you kind of put together a staff? What's the logic behind it? What are the key components to getting that staff? And I know both Steve and Mike, your staffs are really close together and really, you know, committed. They, they were all in. Can you both kind of talk a little bit about, you know, your thought process of putting that staff together? And then after you put them together, how you get them to kind of not be competitive, not, you know, want to be the main guy, but if we're all in this together. How do you do that? Well, for me, I pay everybody the same amount of money. I've never ever had somebody make more dollars than anybody else, and I've never had an associate head coach. Um, I've been an associate head coach before, which really didn't mean anything. Um, I think sometimes titles give people an air of importance that they really don't have. And so with my assistant coaches, it's always been everybody's on the same page as far as – um, money is concerned. Now, I know that football is way, I mean, you got coordinators, you got 
bigger staff. But for me, for my full-time assistants, they're all going to make the same amount of money. That's something that, for me, is important. Um, and I've never changed on that. Um, I try to hire people that um, – that, that, how do I put this? Make my negatives into positives. I, I'm very familiar with what I'm weak at. And so I want people around me that help turn my weaknesses into strengths. And so that's, you know, that's important to me. I think the other thing is loyalty. Um, we're going to disagree and we're going to have big arguments in here, but when we walk out the door, I better know that we're all on the same page. And, and, and I think that's important. I think in recruiting, you just said it, it's not a me thing. It's a we thing. I can't tell you how many times I've been on staffs where that's my player. That's your player. You get in a, you get in a staff meeting and one guy's fighting for, his guy to get playing time and the other guy's fighting for his guy. It's just, it's ridiculous. So I have, we team recruit, um, but, but at the end of the day, I'm the best recruiter on the team. And, and I let my assistant coaches know that, you know, at the end of the day, it's on, I'm going to be the one that decides who comes here and who doesn't because I'm going to be involved. And so um, I think those few things for me with my staff, I don't hire guys. Um, I want guys that are multi multi-talented as far as not just a recruiter. They better be able to coach on the floor because you've seen how I coach. I, I coach hard, but I, I let my assistant coaches coach and I expect them to. And so I don't want – and I want them to be people that are involved in their lives off the court. I want them to be involved in their academics. I mean, I think that's uh, – you know, that's really, really important. I, I have a – I don't have it on me. I have a profile of an assistant coach. I, I think I wrote down about six or seven things. And a lot of those things are what I just said. But um, just off the top of my head, I think for me personally, those are things that are important to me. Yeah, and Steve, those are, hey, those are some really good points. And, and you know, basketball and, and football are, are different in terms of the size of the, the staff. So I, it's a little different. I have a little different view. But I, those are really, really good, good points. You know, one of the things that uh, I learned early on is I was on a staff – uh, in Baltimore when we won the Super Bowl that had Marvin Lewis, who went on to be a head coach, Rex Ryan, who went on to be a head coach, Jack Del Rio, who went on to be a head coach, myself. So there were a lot of A personalities. And one of the things that I learned, and I learned it from Marvin, and Marvin kind of took some of this from Brian Billick, was when you have a staff, you want to have a staff to get together that – one is going to be competent in terms of understanding the game and understanding the rules. And then the second one is that they are striving to be head coaches. Uh, and and I, think, I think that's very important. I think that that should be everybody's goal. If somebody tells me they don't want to be a head coach, uh, and, you know, at some level, it's like, well, that guy's not motivated enough to be a head coach. And the thing that – we did as a staff and I did it with my staff in Atlanta is we all had equal parts. The coordinator called the game, but we set the week up where every coach had an opportunity to talk to the entire offense or the entire defense, stand up and present the game plan for certain segments of the game. And what I felt that that did was it gave those guys an opportunity to be in the role of a coordinator before they got there or of the role of a head coach before they got there. And it worked great. Mm -hmm. So we had a guy that was in charge of short, of short yardage. So he'd get up and he'd make his presentation on Thursday that this is how we're going to stop short yardage plays. And this is the, you know, this is our plan and how we're going to, you know, do it. And they got the opportunity to speak in front of the entire team uh, mm -hmm. on the defensive yeah. and offensive side. And so when we didn't play well, on if we gave up three straight third and ones, that guy that was in charge of third and one, he was devastated. No, yeah. you know, and would come, you know, and would come and coach. I, you know, Smitty, I didn't, I didn't have our guys right. You know, we didn't have it prepared right. And the other thing that when you have these A type personalities, you, you want them to, you, you want them to argue or scrimmage, mm -hmm. and just like you said, Steve, hey during the staff meeting that's when we want to work it all out when we go out on that on that practice field it's all for one and one for all and if you can't do that 
you're not going to be a part of the staff. That's just the way it's going to be. And everybody grows. And we want, I always wanted guys to be, you know, have an opportunity to, to speak in front of the entire team so that they could grow as, as coaches. We even had our assistants to the assistants get up and speak mm. at, least, at least once a week. And I think that no. it gives that, you know, it gives the young coaches, uh, they get an opportunity to see it, but they actually get to experience it. And so we had guys that were first and second year guys in the NFL that were speaking in front of the whole team. And I think that helped them grow as coaches. And I would try to evaluate, uh, you know, try to evaluate it and sit in on the offensive and defensive meetings and give some feedback to the guys. And I think that your, your assistants are always wanting feedback. I always believe when I was an assistant, you know, coach, what can I do better? Or how can I, you know, how can I get this across? Uh, so that's kind of how we approached it. Now, we we scrimmaged a lot. When I say scrimmaged in those staff meetings, and Steve, you know how those are. You, yeah. you, hey, sometimes you're pounding the table. Hey, I think this. But ultimately, we're all together. And when we all go out on the team, you got to have those type of guys. I mean, I, and I, I, I'm gonna, that leads me to something that you said that, one of the unique opportunities in college basketball is that we do recruit, right? So we're on the road at these events a lot with a lot of coaches. And the thing that always amazes me is how many coaches or younger coaches uh, talk about the people they work with. And it just <laughs> amazes me that they think that, well, how I, would, how I would ever hire somebody like that. You know, they would come up to me and talk bad about their situation or what happened on their, in their staff or what happened during recruiting, or I was recruiting this guy, but my this guy wanted this guy. The bottom line is when you walk out that door, you're on the same page. And and um, what happens in the locker room, what happens in the office stays in the office. And, you know, one of the, and one of the reasons why I got the job at a and I didn't know Billy Gillespie at all. And I asked him, why, why did you hire me? He said, because every time I was out on the road, I was watching, you were working. You weren't gossiping. You weren't hey, setting up in the stands talking. You were grinding. You were, you were paying attention to what was going on. And I think there's so much of that going on. And these guys are trying to, get a, trying to get a job and not doing the job that they have. That's a big problem, I think, in any probably profession, uh, especially in athletics, is you got to do the job. You got to do the one you have, and then you get the next one. Um, and, and there's so many guys that just, when they get a job, they want the next one right now. And that, it just doesn't work like that. No, and you you and I are living proof of that, Coach. It there, you know, there's a there's ro a there's roads and there's curves and there's dead ends that you got to back out of, but you just keep your head down and 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 grind. And I think that's such a good point for young coaches. And it'd be one of my other takeaways from today's talk is, uh, you know, don't be worrying about your next job. Do the job you got now as well as you can do, and try to hey, and try to learn to do it better from the people that are around you. Or, or you won't have a job. <laughs> you know, <Amen. laughs> you're, worried about, you're worried about something you don't have and you won't have the one that you had, you know? And I, I think that, you know, people hire people that do, they, they, people pay attention. They, they study, uh, they understand who does a good job and who doesn't. And, um, and I guess for me, the junior college experience taught me that as well is because everybody came in to recruit my players. So I, I had a front porch to everybody's, uh, you know, how they how they approach recruiting, you know, and what their selling points were. And what, I learned a ton just sitting there listening to other coaches sell their programs to my players, you know. And so th there's a lot of ways that, that you can learn. But, you know, ultimately, you know, you just got to do the job that the one that you have. Probably the proudest thing I ever did was when I went to Northwest Florida. You know, the, uh, there was an article in sports, I think, Basketball Times a week, month ago about my experience uh, coming through coaching. And the AD at Northwest Florida is Ramsey Ross. And he said that I was the most low-maintenance coach they've ever had at their school. And, and the reason why that was is because I just did my job. I didn't worry about the things that I didn't have, okay? I just did my job. It's like East Tennessee State. You know, I didn't worry that we didn't have a charter plane and, you know, we didn't have a huge recruiting budget. 
I did the job with the things that we had. And, you know, I think, again, so many coaches, especially younger coaches, want more. You know, sometimes more is less and less is more. They just can't figure that out. Yes, Steve. And, and when you worry, when you start worrying about the things that you don't have, then you're not, do, you're, you're not doing your job. You're not spending time on figuring out how you're going to, how you're going to win the day, you know, and, and I used to tell my guys, sometimes it's about winning the, just win, we got to win the day first, you know, yeah. before we think about winning games. Well, and so what you're just, and what right you're right saying now. is you're just concentrating on things that affect winning and losing. There's so many things out that I don't want to, I don't even want to know, you know, that doesn't affect winning and losing that so many people get caught up in, you know, and that, that's the problem is people get so worried about things that don't affect winning and losing. I concentrate on those things. All that other stuff you can get, deal with on, on its own. I, I don't, I don't get, I don't let that into my thought process. I, I, I stay focused on the things that affect winning and losing and things that affect the welfare of my players. Yes. Yeah, and really interesting because, you know, particularly when I was at BCU and building the program at BCU, one of the things, you know, coaches would come in and, you know, for me personally, I kind of mentioned this, you know, I didn't have sports supervisors, you know, right. every coach, I was their sports supervisor. So I dealt with every head coach because I thought they were the most critical people for us to win games, to build our brand, to have success, to go to NCAA championships, to compete on a national level. But the one thing, so when we'd be talking, you know, and they might have something that they said, you know, I need this or I need that. Uh, and my and my question to them was always, well, tell me how that's going to help us win games, you know. Tell us how that's going to help our players graduate. If you can tell me those two things, then we'll probably find a way to have the, the resources to get that done. But, but that always needed to be – you know, you really had to have a good rationale of how that was going to help you win. It wasn't, well, we need to fly to Timbuktu to play because, you know, for this reason or another. How's that going to help us win games, you know? And that yeah, I think effectively, that's what Coach and I are saying, is that you have to concentrate on that. And, uh, and it's a great example when you're having a relationship with your administrator, your AD, you know, I think so many coaches fight fights that ain't worth fighting. You know, they, they worry about the stuff that, that, that doesn't matter. Like, you know, the color of the garbage cans in the new practice facility or the, you know, I don't have the right door on my office. I don't care about that crap. You know, um, I, I mean, I stepped into the Taj Mahal uh, practice facilities. The guy, um, Mike Mitch Shaw, he's from Atlanta. He's a 30% owner of the Atlanta Hawks. Um, he runs Noble Investments. He built this the facility that I'm sitting in, it's, I mean, it's like Christmas day for me every day. I can't believe the things that we have, but I didn't have that at East Tennessee state. I didn't cry about it. You know, I turned the negatives into positives. Like the dome to me is the best. Uh, what did I say? It was the best training facility in the country. Oh, well, what do you mean? I said, well, it's a one-stop shop. You come to the dome, you can practice, you can, uh, you can lift, you can condition on the turf and you can go upstairs and do academics. And then we're eating in the locker room. So once you get here to the dome, it's the one-stop shop. It's the best training facility in the United States. Now everybody else looks at the dome and goes, oh, my God, that place, you know, it's old. It's a football. No, it's not. It's the best training facility in the country for basketball, right? You know, and that's like here. I mean, I don't have to make the, this place is, you know. But ultimately, it's not about buildings. It's about the people in the buildings, you know. And, and that's what – uh, we're really talking about, right, is, is is getting the right people on the bus, you know, getting the right staff, getting the right players, and then uh, getting everybody moving in the right, you know, in the right direction. And I say that in recruiting all the time because I'm recruiting against high major programs that have the same things we have, like ACC, net television, you know, great education and unbelievable facilities. So what what's the difference? Well, the people are the difference. It's the people that can get you – help you turn your dreams into reality. It's the people that understand as a coach, my job is to get you to do the things you really don't want to do every day in order to get the things that you want out of life. That's coaching to me. It's really not about calling plays or X's and O's. Anybody can drop a play. It's getting your players to do things they really don't want to do to get the things that they want. Well said, coach. Well said. 
sure is. I know, Steve, you, you've got a real job, unlike Mike and myself, you know, so you probably need to, you know, get yeah. some things done. But really appreciate you taking time out. Yeah. We'd love to have you back again, you know, sometime. Uh, I really, you know, I appreciate the amount, the amount of notice that you gave me. Like, I think it was like five minutes or something yeah, like that. Yeah, well, you know, I figured you weren't doing much. You got, you know, you got Brooke Savage and B.J. Mackey. And, well, you know, I got great guys, people. All those guys you took from ETSU. Well, I, I took them all. <laughs> I took them all. Anyway. Except, except Jason, you know, and, and yeah. I was glad Jason. You know, it's always great when your assistant coach gets the job, right? I mean, I think it tells a lot about what you what you were what you were doing and what you built. Is when um, you know, deservedly so, your assistant coach gets the opportunity, you know, to to do it because he has, you know, everybody has their hands on the program. It's not just the head coach, you know. Everybody has their role and their fingers on the program. Now we get all the, you know, we get all the publicity. You get all the, but we also get the blame too, you know. And so. Um, but I was really proud of that. And I appreciate you guys having me on. And I'll try to work on my golf game so yeah. maybe I can jump in there with you. But I'm not really to that point yet. I have a lot of work to do yeah. right across my hallway here in my practice gym. Well, I got a question for you. So we're going to ask this every time. Who would be uh, your choice to, for us to get on to our next uh, – you know, a future. Uh... Well, I mean, that's pretty easy for me because it, I think it's pretty well documented that my best friend is Nick Nurse, who, um, you know, is the head coach of the Toronto Raptors. And, you know, we grew up together, uh, not, you know, more so after professionally and not just, you know, just coaching peers, but just really good friends. And I think he's very innovative in his methods. Um, he's done some things in the NBA that, a lot of coaches weren't really willing to do, you know, as far as probably, you know, some scheme things. But I think with my, with Nick, um, like me, I think the reason why he's able to do that is ba is based on his relationships with his players. Um, you know, and, and I know he had, he had a tremendous relationship with Kawhi Leonard, and that's why he got Kawhi to play the way he played, and they won that they won the world title a year ago. You know, and so uh, I think he'd be great. Well, sometime I'd love maybe maybe you can help us get him and you. Uh, I, I I figured I was getting probably back back in the corner on that one. When I said that. Um, <laughs> I mean, if I think it'd be know. great to get you and Mike and he on there, I don't need to have yeah. any input. You guys are, I mean, you got NFL coach of the year, college basketball coach of the year, and NBA coach there. That'd be pretty interesting. Well, the only the only difference is Mike's not from Iowa. You know, him and I, we're, we're, Iowa stands for idiots out wandering around. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what Nick and I have been doing our entire life. He just went a different direction. You know, I went all over the United States, and he went to Europe and then the D League and the G League and all that to get where he's – I mean, we kind of have the same story, just at a different path and at a different level, you know. And and uh, I think – yeah, I think he would be – uh somebody that a lot of people would probably want to hear from. Yeah, that, that'd be great. So maybe we can work on that. You help us with that. Yeah. Well, I got to do top connect next week. I mean, what else? I mean, I, I'm going to put, you're going to start getting a bill in the mail here pretty yeah, soon. Send me that bill, will you? Yeah, I'm sure we'll get paid. Yeah. <laughs> you know hey. better than that. Well, hey, Steve, I enjoyed it so much. Uh, very, very enlightening for me. And, you know, and it's great to talk. Hey, it's great to talk ball when I say ball just you know whether it's football basketball baseball it's a it's been enjoyable and I wish you the best of luck man I hope uh you know I hope the first hundred days finishes strong for you and well, you, get, you get people on the bus you know you're the you're the new bus driver right you know well, and you got hey you got hey it's your bus and you got to get yeah you got to get those people talking to one another on that bus well, I, I appreciate it, you know, and, and those first 100 days now, this might, there might be a new book coming out called Pandemic, right? <laughs> I mean, I took, I took the first 100 days in a pandemic, which um, probably is not real brilliant, okay? Uh, a lot of new – well, there's no, there's no manual for that, right? I mean, there's just been so much new things every day. It's, it's just really day-to-day you know, with that. And so I appreciate it. Um, 
you know, it's a great place, and uh, they deserve to win, just like ETSU did when I got there. And, and you know, that's our plan. And uh, you guys need to come on down and see me. I got a membership here at Old Town. You guys can hack around, and I'll sit in here and coach basketball. That'd be great. You know, every time, Steve, we try to take – give a couple of takeaways that we either coach Smith or I kind of pick up on. And for me, I think the most significant takeaway for me was just what you said kind of toward the end. I, I mean, you made great comments throughout the whole, you know, through the whole podcast, but I think the one thing is, you know, it's about people. It's not about buildings. It's not about all the accoutrements you have and all that stuff out there. It's about people. It's about getting the right staff. It's getting, you know, the right players. It's getting the right support. It's being out there. So it's all about people. And sometimes people lose track of that. So that's a that's a great takeaway for me. Everybody needs to kind of refocus on that, I think, rather than all the other peripheral stuff. So, Mike, what do you – what yeah. take did you get from this? Man, I've written down – I've written down and scratched down a bunch of notes that I would – that I'm going to go back and look at. But off the top of my head, I think the biggest takeaway that I, that I have – for today's talk is the, about connecting and, and, and coach Forbes talked about how, you know, how he has done it M meeting with and meeting and talking with your players or someone on your staff every single day means that you are always connected to your team. And I think that's the, the, the thing that we all got to remember is that when we're not connected, people don't think positive things. They think negative things yeah. when there's no connection. Right. And what you're doing is, is you're, you're keeping that pipeline of positivity going, Steve. And that, that, to me, that's the biggest, the biggest takeaway that I have, but there's many, many or others. And I hopefully we'll get a chance to do this again. And we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep expanding on this because I admire, I admire the success that you've had. I really appreciate as an, an ETSU alumni, what you did for the basketball program, we knew when you came, you weren't going to be there forever. Uh, and I, I just wish you the best of luck. And we'll be Wake Forest fans in the Smith family, I can assure you that. Thank you very much, Mike. That means a lot to me. I remember meeting you right when I got there and we rode in the car together from the nice swung tournament back to Johnson City. And you gave me a lot of good advice. And, um, you know, I could honestly, when I'm done, I could see my wife and I'm moving back to, to Tri-Cities like you did. Um, yeah. You know, we really like it there. And um, and so, um, again, Doc, appreciate you. And um, look forward to doing this again. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to do it. I mean, it's an exciting, you know, thing that, you know, Coach Smith is kind of – he's kind of the originator of this. He really wants to help young people, young coaches, young administrators, young executives, whatever. And I think, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned. So, Steve, you know, Congrats on an incredible run here at ETSU. You, you know, we talk about culture. You clearly, you know, changed the culture, the support, the identity, you know, the engagement of all the constituencies of ETSU. So, um, you know, you you made a big difference. And, you know, in life, when you make a difference in people's lives, you know, that, I think that's what we're all on the face of the earth for. And you've clearly done it, you know. So thank you for that. And, I know you're busy, so we're going to close this down, and, you know, we'll do it again, and, you know, like I said, you know, clearly, um, we'd love to, I'd love to see you and Mike and, you know, Nick Nurse kind of talk about coaching at the highest level, because you guys. Uh, I'll see what I can do there. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I got a pipeline to him. I know you do. Thanks. All right, guys. Have a great day, Steve. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye. See you.